welcome back to Mind Games with Garen Emig. That's me. And my guest on this episode that we're going to call Let the Games Really Begin is Eli Letterman, my friend and colleague at SelloutCrowd.com. Check out his content, my content, our colleagues' content at SelloutCrowd.com. We have columns, analysis, profiles, Q&As, fun and games, and podcasts flooding the zone, as they say. So we appreciate the fact that you guys have responded well to what we've done to this point. We've only been up and running for a week, six days, not even a week. Uh, as of this recording, uh, and so keep uh, keep after it. We'll we'll make it worth your while. Um, Eli, well, you and I are going to get to some Big Twelve things as we are yeah. headed toward the, the weekend. We're going to get to some fun stuff out of the uh, toward the end of involving again proper football, not just the game that Oklahoma knows and loves, um, as well as a question about beer versus seltzer that I the world needs to hear your response to. First, let's start with the Sooners since that's the team you cover. You have an Andrew Anthony piece that as of this taping has not dropped, but will, I bet, by the time people can hear and, and see this. What did you learn about the OU receiver from Michigan? Yeah, I, uh, it should be up by the time you're hearing this. And I had the opportunity this week, we, we saw Andrew Anthony have his, his big kind of debut for OU against Arkansas State. We got to chat with him about it on Monday, and then I spent some time chatting with his parents, Andrew Sr. and Vicky uh, in East Lansing. And learned a lot about the family, learned a lot about Andrell, uh, and learned really about what the journey to get here was to, to leave Michigan, the school that, you know, he was a kid from East Lansing, whose dad drives a bus through the campus at Michigan State, but who always dreamed of going to Michigan. And wow. he got to do it for two years. Love but that. after those two years, it was clear to the, to the family, to Andrell, that it was time to make a change for, for his future. It wasn't a, a, an offense that really fit his skill set. So he landed in Oklahoma, and last Saturday really was kind of the culmination of that journey. Uh, and it was really cool to kind of get that little behind the scenes with the family this past week. Sooners may need Andrew Anthony a little bit more on Saturday. They may need a little bit more from their offense against SMU. They didn't need more than a field goal to beat uh, a pretty pitiful, to be frank, Arkansas State team that, that came to, to Owen Field last week. I get the feeling, uh, Eli, that the test is going to come though on defense for, for OU. If, if this is a stepping up in class, the more I research the Mustangs and not just the fact that they have four, four star players potentially lined up in their, in their backfield slash wide receiver, but that uh, Rhett Lashley, the head coach likes to, likes to run plays. The Mustangs in his first year, a year ago were third in the country with an average of 81 snaps per game. They had 79 in their win over La Tech to open their season last week. Oh, you only had to play 50 defensive snaps in disposing of Arkansas State. They're going to sweat a little bit, I think, on defense this weekend. Uh, another stat for you, SMU finished seventh in passing yards a year ago under Rhett Lashley. I think this is an offense that, that looks a lot like the OU offense, the one they're running with Jeff Levy. They're going to move fast. They're going to go downfield. And they're going to run a lot of plays. So OU's going to have a very different taste this weekend, and, and even stylistically. Last weekend, they got to sit back with seven in coverage, rush for and really just leaned in on, on what they had in the secondary this week, you know, they're going to go downfield. You know, they're going to get tested. Peyton Bowen said it the other night that, you know, they expect a lot of 50, 50 balls. So we're going to find out. I, I think Gentry Williams is going to get his first real test as a starter. And, and he's, it's going to be sink or swim for a lot of guys in that secondary and for this defense on the whole, but you mentioned the talent they've got Preston stone, the quarterback who this will be his third career start, but he, He's the highest rated quarterback they've ever had at SMU. They've gone to the portal. We heard it from Jeff Levy, from Ted Roof, and then Brent Venables about all that SMU did in the portal this year to, to bolster the roster. And they've got explosive guys. They have talent. And so it's it's going to be a better test. I, I think we might have talked to, about this on the Letterman jacket the other day. Mm -hmm. I think you could argue this is OU's toughest game until Red River. They mm -hmm. go to Tulsa from here, Cincinnati and Iowa State. I mean, since we're dis dispatching with – conference designations is meaning anything in terms of, of scale. I think, you know, SMU really could be the, the toughest yeah. game they have before they get to Dallas uh, in, in October. And that's why this is going to be maybe the best insight we have yet, certainly into the Sooners. I want to ask you one speed. You brought it up just now, and I want to, I want to leave SMU behind with, with this again. We caught, I don't, it's not an accident that I named the show mind games. I want, I want us to do a little thinking now and then I want our listeners and viewers to think with us. And I wonder if we should stop just for a second sometime before 
Saturday's 5 p.m. kickoff and think how absurd, mad, insane, whatever word you come to, uh, to grips with, it is that starting next year, SMU is going to the Atlantic Coast Conference. I don't know how many OU fans at the stadium will even realize that SMU ever went to the American Athletic Conference. I'm not sure that's been digested. And because we're sort of numb to everything when it comes to realignment, here now is SMU and two California schools from the Pac-12 bordering the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> joining the Atlantic Coast Conference. Is there a reason to care about this? I, I, you know, I asked Mike Gundy on, on Monday at his press conference as they got ready to play a Pac-12 school that's coming to the Big 12 next year in Arizona State and that the Pac-12 is disintegrating. Should we feel just a little bit of remorse about any of this? And he gave a pretty decent answer. Venable sort of skipped past the SMU to the ACC question. But what about you and me? What do we think? Well, you, you're telling me when you think Atlantic Coast, you don't think Dallas, Texas? <laughs> Come on. This is college football, baby. Forget all the regional stuff. No, that's that's what we're going to lose here. That's where the opportunities are, evidently. We're, we've got coastal schools in the Big Ten. We've got... Uh, OU in Texas, I guess we could say somewhat the South, but then and as Greg Sankey will tell you, the SEC remains in however many contiguous states. So they've kept some kind of regional footprint by that math. But this is the new normal. And yeah, that we've got Pacific Coast teams in the ACC. We have a team in Dallas, Texas going to the ACC. Um, and I, you, I think you tweeted out earlier today, uh, uh, something you'd gotten from a reader, right? About the loss mm -hmm. of regional rivalries. That's mm -hmm. what we're losing here. And that's where I think Brent Venable is almost similar to his transfer portal answer to you earlier this week, where he said, I don't love it, but I'm not going to, you know, not embrace it. I have to, it's the and, same. And I, and I have no power in it. I have no say. Right. right. And Sense. that's another good point. But you know, that, I think his answer on SMU was similar where, he says, and he said this often in, in relation to a lot of things, but often on topics like this, Brett Venables loves college football. He likes the stories. He loves all of it. And there's no way you can look at this and not see something of what college football is getting torn apart. You could say it's been happening for a very long time. The Big 12 wasn't always the Big 12. Uh, it, it's not new to, to just these last few years, but something is, is changing there. But on the flip side, it's the, the way of, of the world of college football that goes without saying. And it's, you know, for a school like SMU, I, I think this move is interesting for, for Stanford and Cal, but SMU, when you look at this, is this maybe being their one shot to do it. Mm -hmm. And they're going to do it on the, the back of all the financial backing they have. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it is pretty cool in another picturing SMU going to Wake Forest and uh, NC State. Virginia Tech is, is kind of hard to stomach. Yeah. They've never lacked for money at SMU. It's just size of school, you know, re out, outreach from uh, in terms of alumni. I mean, they're only going to draw so many fans. They did just, just it, to, I think, is, is it still called Gerald Ford Stadium? Do they still play it? Good question. At, at the Jerry? I don't know, because OU's going there in a few years. He, Eli, Gerald Ford was a president. Yeah, it, it, catch me up here. Uh, Gerald Ford came to came to uh, office in the 70s. I, I used to, I almost double majored in history and it's a, sh it's a shame to admit that I don't exactly remember the year, but. Um, <laughs> what, he would have been like late 70s now. Preceded Jimmy Carter, so yeah, 75. So You're talking to a history minor here. Yeah. Journalism and then history minor. I really didn't want to have anything especially useful or a backup plan here. What I get for bringing it up just to take a shot at you. You double back and end up making me look small. <laughs> I deserve that. Um, it's still Gerald Ford Field, by the way. I did a quick little search. Uh, you it is indeed multitasking. Pretty soon it might be Gerald Ford Field at AT and T Stadium, brought to you by uh, HEB. That's <laughs> probably where we're headed here in honoring. I'm so envious of your multitasking. How many TikToks have you done since we started this show? Six. Yeah. You let me know when you do a seventh. I'll join you. Um, all right. Let's let's leave OU for just a bit. Go to the Big Twelve. Have a little have a little fun with the conference while it's still the big 12 as we know it does texas hang in in tuscaloosa i think yes mm -hmm. i don't know for how long i would you know on my podcast we play a little game of gear in or gear out but i would in that same vein if you said you know will texas be hanging on in the fourth quarter i might lean or or hanging on as well as it did a year ago i might lean against that mm -hmm. i 
it just doesn't have that same feel. But then again, this is going to be the proof in the pudding for Texas, right? If Texas is back, if they are the class of the Big 12 that a lot of people think them to be, this is the the time to, to show it. And to go against an Alabama team that might be in better shape, you know, two, three months down the road. Yeah. And could be a playoff team. But if, if there was a time to see them, it might be right now. And this defense can certainly show something going up against, you know, a, a quarterback who's still settling in there. I would caution everyone to remember that Texas looked as though it was really onto something by hanging in a year ago in Austin and they finished eight and five, right? So again, similar to how OU started hot out of the gate and gave fans hope only to finish six and seven. We got to be careful, not just with what we saw last week, but probably for the next few before we, we really pass final judgments here. Yeah. And I would caution again, I think I brought it up last week, Steve Sarkeesian has never been the head coach of a team that won more than nine games. So he's going to have to buck some history there this year. And they just might. They they may well be, as we said, the class of this conference. They could uh, head to Arlington with one loss and be in contention for the playoff. But uh, it's it's staggering to think about how far back it's been since Texas was that relevant. Mm-hmm. And because of that and because we haven't seen it and because we haven't seen it from Steve Sarkeesian, I don't think anyone's really ready to jump on that ship yet until we start to see it. Here's the thing, man, we, this, this league need, the big 12 needs a, they sort of need a restart. And I mean, we could, we could land on specific games like Texas Bama, which, which we've now talked about on both of our shows. We could, we could go to Lubbock, right? They get the ducks to Oregon's at tech. I think this weekend, I got that right. Get a bone um, to pick with whoever made that scheduling decision to send tech, if, whoever in Lubbock decided to send tech to Wyoming and then to come home to play Oregon. You're saying they should have also played in – they should have done that in reverse? Is that what you're saying? They shouldn't have done it at all. That's a he- heck of a start to a season. Everyone knows Wyoming's a tough place to go play, and then you, you welcome Oregon. That to uh, you, No one would have expected 0-2, but that is kind of what you're welcoming. So you're, you're saying don't man up and play good are – you, are, you, are you speaking – Correct. You're, so you're, like one, you one. You know Barry Trammell will tune into this show, and you know what he's written about teams I essentially well, bleeping out when it comes to scheduling tough non-conference games anymore. Well, and I'm not opposed to those. I think we need more of them. But a trip to Wyoming followed by a visit from Oregon. That's, I don't know if you could draw up a. You don't think that's reasonable? That's I don't. That, think- I. Mean, I I think you go beat or- what you do is you go beat Wyoming and then hope that well sure but they didn't and they've made life harder on themselves unnecessarily that trip to Wyoming has tripped up so many teams Missouri 2019 go up there with Kelly Bryant thinking they were going to have a great year they lose that game all I'm saying is that's not the easiest road game you could give yourself oh, no it's not I hear what you're and saying we're getting the next one and I'm all four teams playing better games we need more than you know what next year Oklahoma's got help me here. Tulane. Their, their big one is Houston. Maine and their Houston. power five opponent is Houston. With right. They, we need better than that. But I we agree. also, if I'm if I'm Joey McGuire, I'm assuming this got all put together before he was there. I'm thinking, man, that's a really hard start to the year we gave ourselves, and here we are. Yeah. That this is this is the reason. You don't need to give yourself gimmies, but I think they made life harder on themselves than they needed to, and we might be staring at zero and two before you know they can even hit conference play. Something else we're going to drive home on mind games moving forward is there are two things that are of divergent opinions and sort of run counterintuitive that can be true. Believe it or not, we don't have to see everything in one, you know, one mold or, or dimension or whatever you want to call it. Your point is right. They didn't do the, the Red Raiders did not do Joey McGuire. Keep, I keep wanting to call him Harry McGuire. Uh, <laughs> Toby? <laughs> Toby? Harry? <laughs> Al. Al McGuire <laughs> didn't do him any favors. I get it. But Wyoming, last I checked, is still a G5 opponent, right? You, they didn't yeah. load up back-to-back power fives out of the gate. They're bringing Oregon to Lubbock after going to Laramie. I don't think it's too much to ask for them to at least split and maybe even go 2-0. and Now the best he can do is split. That's all I'm saying. Reasonable. But, okay. I, again, I think they made life hard on themselves. And right. uh, most programs aren't doing that. Yeah. Well, Back to the Big 12 and the importance yep. of, of the weekend, right? And it is, it is for Texas. It is for Tech. It, Baylor hosts Utah. That's interesting now. After, yep. after the Utes uh, just completely bundled up Florida and Baylor loses to G.J. Kinney's Texas State Bobcats, I think they are, mm-hmm. Eli. Okay, we get that right. Iowa State. and Iowa State, that hasn't gone well for the Cyclones for a while, I don't think. 
it, even Kansas game on Friday night in Lawrence against Illinois is 50 50. So you you're making this is if you're going to get attention going into a conference schedule, if you're the Big 12 looking to gain an early foothold, whether with committee members, playoff committee members or ESPN talking heads or or fan bases, you need to strike now. I, I left out OSU Arizona State. There's a classic case of, of a team that's got something to prove out of a out of a league that has something to prove. You need to strike a lot harder and a lot better this week than you did a week ago. It's a, it's a huge opportunity one way or another for this conference. I mean, the worst case scenario for the Big 12 this year, right, speaking relatively, is OU in Texas being the cream of the crop of the conference. Well, maybe the rest of the conference, the remaining members, the new members are a bit down, let's say. Like, let's say Baylor doesn't, you know, loses this weekend to Utah and doesn't really scratch back. Maybe TCU takes a step back. Tech could have two losses after this weekend. That's got to be the worst case scenario for a league that needs to sell itself in every way you just mentioned, whether it's the committee. Um, they're lucky they've got the media rights partnership already locked up. I heard it said this week, the Pac-12 this year is going to be more fun than it's been in years. If they had this conference and this collection of talent two years ago, they'd probably have a, a TV deal and be just fine. The Big 12, great point. in terms of good timing, it really helped that that 2021 season, and, and a year ago as well, where – not only was the conference competitive and really strong, but all four of the con uh, conference title game opponents the last two years uh, are remaining members. That all really worked for the Big 12. They need, as you said, a rebound this weekend and, and to be sure they kind of keep it up this season because I think we th this horse race isn't over. I would mm -hmm. say right now the Big 12 has asserted it itself as the third conference, and that was what we always talked about two years ago when realignment began. There's going to be the SEC. There will be the Big Ten. Who's going to be the third? The Big 12 somehow got itself there, but that's not a permanent spot. And and they're going to need the conference to pull it together from a big picture perspective yep. uh, in the next couple months. Everything sort of circles back. Did you see what Rhett Lashley said about uh, when, when it was announced SMU was headed to the ACC? I think I did. The only We're the only... We just became the only <laughs> Metroplex team in the third best conference in college football, direct hit across the bow, across the mm -hmm. Metroplex to TCU, which is uh, apparently in Rhett Lashley's mind, uh, banished still to the Big 12. Uh, I might actually put the Big 12 as third right now, not in terms of in terms of football, not in terms of money, not in terms no. of I, revenue. It's pretty close, but in terms of football. And one more thing before before we get off the, our soapboxes about you know how this thing is looks in the age of college football Inc. I, again, pour one out for the pack. I, I did this week with my column after coming out of the Gundy press conference for sellout crowd. But Eli, these guys, all they did was go twelve and zero last weekend, mm -hmm. right? They're thirteen and zero when you consider USC's week zero win. They may have three Heisman Trophy candidates at quarterback between Caleb Williams. Michael Penix, Bo Nix, they, they not just won. I mean, again, everyone's opening with just about with green puffs. So it's not like they shouldn't have run up the score, but they did run up the score in a lot of the Oregon put 81 on somebody, right? USC scoring in the sixties. I, I think Washington Oregon state looked good with the Clemson transfer quarterback. So here's, here's a league that we've known about for uh, as long as we've been alive that is going away starting 12 and 0 or having a 12 and 0 weekend starting 13 and 0 and and instead of having everyone sort of celebrate everyone's either lamenting their fate or they're still taking shots or making fun of it that's incredible i think the, the pac-12 is going to be the most fun conference in college football this year and so pour one out for for that for some of those schools for the kind of greater history of college football as you said this is a conference that's been around as long as we've been alive, uh, I happened, I got pulled into college football by those USC teams and with Reggie Bush and Matt Leiner and all that, who I won't pour one out for are the university presidents and conference leadership in the Pac-12 that kind of sat on its hands mm -hmm. and allowed this to happen. That's where you, you feel terrible for the institution right. and for what it means to the game and, and certainly for some of these schools and the fact that now, if your kid plays at Stanford uh, and you live in California, you don't have that regional footprint. You're going to be going to road games at mm -hmm. Virginia Tech and, and Miami and wherever else. 
but for the conference leadership, there's very little sympathy there. No, the, the, the phrase I used in the column, administrative incompetence, right? Some will see it as academic arrogance. I'm not saying that, that this is not the Pac-12's fault that this has happened. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I, but I am saying that it's incredible that it has happened is all. And, and uh, I, it's, just, it's just insane to me that that league is literally vanishing. Uh, the down to, essentially down to Washington State and Oregon State. What do they do? You think they just should just sit tight and hold on to their? They've got what? Don't they have a bid? Or there? Well, there's the the automatic bids, qualifying bids for the playoff. I imagine those are going to get chopped up, but maybe they can just dig their feet in and hold on to them. I would. Uh, well, Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American, is about to lose SMU. I assume he's been on the phone a lot, right? In the Mountain West, I assume he's been on the phone a lot with. Uh, the Cougars and the Beavers. Um, I, I just it, for the for two again power five schools to have to suddenly find a home is uh, is is insane. And as Gunny pointed out, I mean, if you if you're an OSU fan, you you notice the fact the Beavers have gotten better. I mean, we don't think of Oregon State football as anything to even notice around here. They gave the Cowboys a pretty good game a few years ago in Corvallis, right? And they've only built on that. They're ranked, so they're good. They're yeah. no joke this year. They were they were really good last year, and they're no joke this year. Uh, so it's an attractive proposition. Uh, you'd think if you could play God, so to speak, you'd probably just merge the Mountain West into the Pac-12 and keep the brand name and the whatever they've got in terms of playoff guarantees. But good luck. But why Why should the Mountain West be the one to fold mm -hmm. uh, when it's got all the power there? There's not a whole lot for Washington State and Oregon State to, to bargain with. Yep. We're going to have a little fun before we uh, go on about our day. Exit question time with Eli Letterman. And let's begin with, well, let's go back to OU for just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about Jackson Arnold a little bit, had a little discussion about his debut last Saturday and how the hype machine is, is on 11, to borrow a Spinal Tap reference with this kid. So here's, here's a point blank, man. If he goes out, picks up where he left off this Saturday, assuming he, he gets a chance to pick up where he left off. We'll see what the score looks like against SMU. This is an Archie State, folks. All right, this isn't 73 to nothing coming. But if he does, number of moms, parents, I guess we'll say, parents who name their kids Jackson <laughs> between now and the end of the season, what would you guess? Well, let me OU go. Fan, OU fans' parents. Right. Let's, 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 let's throw that caveat in. I suppose I should have phrased it that way. Go ahead. I'll filibuster a little. There was a video that came out of uh, the LSU Florida State tailgate scene from, <laughs> from the weekend, right? Uh, from Metal Arc Media. And the question, they, they discovered a guy who's an LSU fan born in the early 2000s with the middle name Saban. As in, his parents watched Nick Saban lead LSU to a, uh, a national title and never thought he'd leave let alone leave and coach one of the big rival schools, Alabama. So there's a kid who's a student at LSU right now. His middle name is Saban. It's a middle name though, right? Not a first name. name. Is Saban. So first name Jackson. Um, would they have to be babies born in the month, like in the next few weeks? Between now and the end of the season, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm asking you if he goes out and, you know, 10 for 10, 11, you know, whatever he was, was it 11 for 11? I, yeah, I'm, 11. The only, I'm the only Oklahoma that doesn't have that committed to memory. <laughs> I, uh, I'd put the over under at 10, 10 babies for now, but let's just say there were a scenario where he became the starting quarterback and it went, well, we're bumping those up. There's plenty <laughs> of Lincolns and Rileys. Like do I meet dogs around here named Lincoln and Riley. And then that, that lands in that place. I, I think people are pretty safe with Jackson Arnold, yeah. but I, I've met, you know, that, that people make those errors sometimes. You can name your kids, you give your kids middle name Saban or you can name your dog Riley. And hey, uh, you never know. You know what? Hey, Eli, you know what happens when you take your dog for a walk now and he does what some dogs do in yards? You know, the thing we have to take the little paper sure. and pick it up. That's that's called that's instead of the dog being called Lincoln. Now, what the dog does is called Lincoln. Woof. That's what I hear. Woof. That's, not, that's not me. I didn't do Woof. that. I didn't. I'm just telling you, I've heard it in some neighborhoods. That's what they call it. That's what they call it. OK, like the leafy. I, I don't. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a dog anymore, so I, right. I can't play that game. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Learn some All right. <laughs> SMU. We let's leave the, the Mustangs behind with this. 
If I say Pony Express, do you, do you, honestly, be honest with me now. Do you think of a sequel to the Tom Hanks Christmas movie? (laughs) I wish they'd make a sequel. I think of the mail carrying service. I think of the Tom Hanks movie, but no, I do think of, and I'm aware of, well aware of those early, what, 1980s SMU teams that were, Mm -hmm. that took the nation by storm. I think co-national champions at one point. Um, I think of Eric Dickerson. Uh, and I think of those beautiful uniforms on that old turf that they would have played on back then that like really looked like a carpet. And then I think of all the, all the fallout from it, which is certainly timely to think of now as SMU in the NIL era and the transfer portal era in the realignment era kind of seems to be back on the, on the front foot. Uh huh. Yeah. The days of the, the, they had the mesh jerseys. They didn't have the tearaways. I don't think, but they had the mesh that you could sort of, you know, see through mm-hmm. it came down just like a somewhere between the belly button and the chest, right? I mean, it was, I mean, it was a cutoff basically. The jerseys that they surely there was a time you rocked one of those those cutoff football. I wore, dude, I wore so many cutoffs to school. I wore cutoff. Here's the thing: cutoff shirts, cutoff jean shorts, but the socks, quite the opposite, man, up to near the knees, man. With the the tube socks with the with the three red stripes at the top. I think they were ponies, or were they spot built? Eli Spot Belt was a company that specialized in outfitting everyone's gym teachers in the 70s. <laughs> I, I'm sure that now you haven't heard that. Tell me, no, you know what I have, and I want to say it had to do with Barry Sanders reporting a story on him or one of the old running backs. And still, no, you know what? I think it was Terry Miller who wore some special mm-hmm. undergarment that had to do with Spot Belt. Maybe I'm mixing up my. Uh, my stories now, but I, I can say I, I do know it, but not evidently as well as you did getting to live it. Here's your proper football question of the week. Okay. The U S is back in action Saturday. Uh, you, I think they're playing Uzbekistan. I think tune yeah. in. Greg Bearhalter has been reinstated as head coach. Correct. Mm-hmm. Who lasts longer on with the U S men's national team, Greg Bearhalter or Gio Reyna? Well, the easy answer is to go with Gio Reyna thinking that his career, what he's 20, 21 years old, will, will outlive Greg Berhalter's, even if it's a really successful run over the next three, four, six, eight years with the U.S. men's national team. Will his career with Greg Berhalter last as long? I don't know. I don't like everything we've heard of, about that, of that they still haven't really spoken. For those needing catching up, it was the most travel soccer story of travel soccer stories, except it played out at the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, it was Giorena's parents basically lobbying for playing time, and it got really ugly. So I don't know how that's going to go. It's icy. You, you, you were you were a whippet back in the day. You know the soccer scene and all the drama that comes with it. You've been a soccer parent. What do they need to do to repair this? How do they, can they repair it? They can. Uh, I don't know the the mechanisms of United U.S. national team soccer. So I, if the fact that they haven't yet apparently leads me to think that they've closed off uh, avenues to, to repair it. And that's troubling. I don't know whose fault it is. I don't know. I, I don't have a side in this fight. I want the U S to, to I don't, whatever it takes to win matches, right. When friendly tournaments even compete for world cups, I I'm all for it. I'm all for the momentum continuing in this country when it comes to soccer. Uh, so I, I just think it sucks that it's that this has become sort of a, a drama and that it hasn't been solved now that bear halters back as a, as a head coach. So whatever it takes, get it done would be my message. Here's my question. If you, how, how much further along would the game in this country be? If you were in charge of us soccer starting, <laughs> up in how many world cups do we have? If you, not head, not managing, but just in a director's role, running the whole organization. No offsides. Uh, card system that goes up to like seven levels instead of two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Maybe put, maybe put boards around the outdoor fields. <laughs> just American, American, Americanize the crap out of the game is what I'm saying, right? Great. Um, I, I gosh, I'd like to go ten minutes on that, but let's let's get out with this. When is it acceptable? A red-blooded American to take to choose seltzer over beer. In your opinion, 
He has like a, a hard, like a hard shot. seltzer, a hard seltzer. Yeah, a hard seltzer over beer, whatever, whatever they're calling it. I, I sure. still think, yeah, male, female. I don't. I'm not. Age group doesn't matter. Wherever you are doesn't matter. What, when is it acceptable? I don't see it ever acceptable. So convince me that there is a scenario where you would pick seltzer over the real thing. Uh, for any red blooded American, anytime they'd like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. People should do what they want. We need more of that. Uh, have a seltzer if you'd like, there's enough on the line here have a seltzer. for Eli Letterman, 0% of the time. I can't drink seltzers. That's a story for another podcast another day. But, uh, <laughs> we need your, what we need your doctor to come on with us to explain that. A doctor could help. No, I, the, again, there's uh, another story for another podcast. Okay. I'm sorry. But, no, 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 no. But uh, I, 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 you'll never see me with a seltzer in my hand unless I'm bringing it to somebody. Uh, so I'm all for them for whoever wants them, but not for me. And evidently not for you, Garrett. I'm not going to knock on your door uh, and with a, a six or of high noons in my don't, hand. Just don't, man. I mean, maybe over champagne if I've, if I've got to choose there just because it takes me about one minute to get a migraine. Yeah. After, after sipping champagne. But let's just I, stick to old fashions, man. We do that. We'll be golden. We'll, we will work old fashions plenty into mind games moving forward. <laughs> as long as you're my guest, I, I have no doubt about that. Um, we'll be back. I'm pretty sure to do another uh, one of these next week, whether it's on your show, the Letterman jacket, or you're coming on mine, mind games. We, we love doing this stuff. Uh, we thank Jacqueline Musgrove, our tireless producer for putting this, uh, this together every week. You can check out any shows that we crank out on the sellout crowd network. I still have to look at my cheat sheet, YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. I'll get used to it. Uh, all sorts of platforms. You know where to go a lot more than, than me. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for reading our content at sellout crowd. We will wish you all a great week.